That's all right, thanks everyone for coming uh, to the seminar today. Uh, today we've got Ron McAllister, who is going to be coming to talk to us a bit about model uh, what matters, planning aware perception and prediction for autonomous driving. So Rowan is a former alumni, actually the ACFR and University of Sydney. I think probably last year in about 2008, 2009, that sort of time. Yeah, uh, yeah, for undergrad. But then, um, but then I was here 2010 to 2012 wow. with Robert Fitch and Thierry yeah. from the Masters as well. Got it. Yeah, so it's been a good 10 years, I guess, since you've sort of yeah, 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 here, totally so it's great to come back. <laughs> the only change is that podium, I think. <laughs> yeah, it, is. Yeah, it, is. it does actually look the same. I don't know if this is, in, but yeah, yeah, it's, it's pretty much all Probably the same. Yeah. Vintage 2012. So <laughs> um, and um, so, as you were mentioning, you used to do the undergrad and masters here with Rob Fitch yeah. and um, Thierry uh, Bonneau, working on autonomous navigation over unstructured terrain. And Rowan later obtained his PhD at the University of Cambridge, working on Gaussian processes and reinforcement learning, and later did a postdoc at the University of California, Berkeley working on deep reinforcement learning and is now a machine learning scientist at the Toyota Research Institute in California. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thanks a lot, Ron. Pass off to you. Great, yeah, thanks so much. Yeah, uh, yeah, so yeah, thanks everyone for coming along. And it's uh, it's really it's really fun being back. Uh, there's a lot of uh, good memories of being in this place uh, and a lot of the work that we did. So anyway, uh, without further ado, I'll get, I'll get started. So I was trying to think of like, um, the, you know, the past few works, what, what's kind of like the common theme. And I think the common theme is, is basically this. So I, I work in autonomous driving quite a bit now. And, um, and, and some of the things that we've been um, thinking about, uh, like during my postdoc, but also at um, Toyota Research is, uh, is, you know, this, this idea of like, you know, what, what do models really need to capture? And so, you know, they can capture a whole lot of things, but, you know, we would ideally like to, them to capture the things that like really matter. And so what really, you know, what defines what matters is ultimately what the robot does, right? So, so basically that's kind of why I think, you know, some of the works that we're working on, it's, it's really about planning aware perception prediction. So can you, you know, can you work on the elements of, you know, perception prediction that really focus on the things that matter for like downstream planning? So a typical autonomous vehicle um, pipeline, uh, or at least like in the, the kind of modular camp, um, uh, like um, uh, uh, set of kind of software stacks is, is kind of often looks something like this, where you've got like some kind of perception stack and then and you have people designing like a prediction stack to kind of understand how pedestrians and other vehicles might drive around uh, uh, the ego vehicle, uh, and then maybe some path planning and then, and then ultimately control. And so, so this work to kind of put it in perspective is really to, you know, rather than just kind of treating this as like designing this as like a feed forward uh, type thing in the design of these software stacks, can we also kind of think back the other way? So like how might planning uh, affect predictions in a way, in ways that like ultimately help planning, same thing with perception. Um, so the outline is basically, yeah, uh, these, these three papers and, um, and actually, just for a time check, should that is forty minutes okay? Is yeah, that, that's right. Yeah, okay, cool. Um, and, and I'll be around for a few hours afterwards if uh, yeah, if people have questions and stuff. Um, uh, so yeah, basically, one of these works is on the, the perception side of things, and then there's another couple of um, works on the um, prediction and trajectory forecasting um, type of things that the robot robot might want to do with you know agents around itself that you know dynamic obstacles that it needs to be able to predict. Uh, okay, so yeah, the first one. Um, so this was this was some work at um, uh, Berkeley, uh, and so the idea starts off with yeah. So perceptions are all percepts equally important. Um, so you know you could imagine a toy scenario here where you've got like two images, um, and maybe you've got some kind of irrelevant aspects to the image, so like houses or clouds or trees or something like that, and you've for autonomous driving, the autonomous driving task, you've probably got things that are much more relevant, like where is the road, where are the other vehicles? Um, and then you may have something that, you know, something down here that looks a little bit different. And this work was really about saying, well, if the irrelevant details differ from each other, but the actual relevant things, maybe the car make doesn't, you know, matter too much between these two types of cars, but its position and velocity does and the shape of the road does, um, uh, can we basically learn to collapse these two things to the same latent state? Like really they mean the same thing as far as the car's planning is, is concerned. 
Um, and as opposed to something here where the, you know, maybe there's no vehicle and you know, the, the road's kind of uh, you know, going off into a different direction. And actually, Don, when we put up a few years ago, this is, we were talking about this idea and then yeah, we finally turned it into a paper. So this is, this is continuing from our chat three years ago. Uh, so there's so basically we were kind of interested in like learning a representation that's useful for downstream uh, control and there's many ways of doing um, I don't know if I can get uh, rid of that um, anyways that basically says by simulation um, yeah um, and so there's many different ways of learning representations of rich visual scenes that are then useful as like smaller latent codes or something like that for learning downstream controllers. Uh, often, um, often people use things like autoencoders, basically try to encode everything in the scene, including the birds in the sky, the trees, the houses, the things that don't matter. Um, and a lot of reinforcement learning literature has basically hugged onto these benchmarks in Majoku and Atari. And it's kind of it's it's kind of interesting because basically the, the claim that we were trying to make in this work is that there's um, not many um, visual distractions or noise in these environments. So if there's any, any visual variation, it's probably task relevant. And that's, and that's kind of the opposite of real robotics in the field. Generally, there's a lot going on and the vast majority of it doesn't matter. Um, so you know, humans, humans don't necessarily perceive everything. They'll kind of look out for the things that you know maybe kind of jump on the road right in front of them. They're not so concerned with what's happening behind them or what's happening 400 meters off to the left. Uh, they tend to focus on things that are more relevant. Um, and so, and so, one of the questions we we're trying to ask was: Do generative models that try to reconstruct the entire scene and encode everything do they degrade the more task irrelevant information that we have, like getting towards towards more real world scenarios? Um, and and so the uh, the the type of representation that we were kind of interested in comparing against these like auto encoded type um, uh, methods of encoding everything in a scene. Um, was something related to what's called the by, by simulation metric. So what this is, is it's, it's a way of basically working at a distance between two observations um, that, that represents the behavioral difference. So like in that previous example, the two kind of blue images that I had before, they were very similar behaviorally, even though visually they were quite different, um, as opposed to maybe other images where the car wasn't there. And so this can be defined uh, recursively as, you know, if we've got some kind of cost function that the, or reward function that the planner is looking at and trying to optimize, basically the maximum distance between the very next um, rewards plus a recursive term on the next distance. And so basically this is a recursive representation such that if we roll it out, effectively what it is, is the maximum over difference in rewards or costs at this time step and then the next time step down uh, discounted and so on and so on um, over the horizon that we're planning. Um, and so the, the representation to learn something like this, to learn a kind of representation uh, Z that's an encoding of observation. Basically what we were trying to do here is work, work out a representation such that distance and latent space is going to be equal. Um, uh, so this is our soft constraint here in MSC error between this distance and that by simulation distance. Um, so I've probably jumped into the math a bit too early, but I'll show you what it means visually. So, um, and so this is basically looking like what we just saw there before. Um, and um, we kind of implemented um, uh, the, the distance here between two distributions in latent space with the wash assigned distance. Um, but basically, yeah, okay, so to, to give you an example of like different distractions, we started off in, in Majoku first, uh, used useful for a lot of reinforcement learning uh, benchmarks. And this is this is what it looks like. Well, this is DeepMind Control's version of it. So we've got some, uh, we've basically got some different robots here with the generic backgrounds. But we can replace that backgrounds with like kind of floating blobs that they're a little bit distracting moving around. And then we can also replace the background with just natural videos. So this is getting, Quite a bit more complex on, on the very last one. And then we can see how different models do. Uh, and um, actually, sorry, I forgot I had this slide. I think this is this is basically this is basically what it looks like when they're moving. So you know we're trying to learn how to control these these robots uh, from this image alone. 
so yeah, top ones are kind of a bit easier. Bottom ones are a little bit more reflective of uh, real robotic scenarios where we've got a lot of visual distraction. And so what we were able to find is um, at least two years ago at the time, uh, soft legs and active critic um, was one of the better, uh, the, the best uh, generative modeling way of learning from visual control. And so that's in purple here. And that would do quite well on these kind of simple tasks that people often used as their benchmarks. And then our method here was in green, the by simulation. So we actually didn't do so well when you know there isn't that much distraction. Um, but getting a little bit more complex than the kind of the performances kind of tend to equate. Uh, and then when you get really complex, that's when these generative models just kind of fail abysmally, like trying to basically encode everything that's happening in the real world scene, uh, when really there's only a minority of information that's actually um, important. And so like kind of looking at the representation space, looking at this latent space, uh, like a T-SNE of it, um, this is, this is kind of what it looks like. So if you take pairs of images with the robot in the same state, but the background kind of completely different, you can see the encoder matching these two um, states to basically very close to the same area in latent space. And, and the coloration here is the cost to go. Um, so you can see that there's a lot of consistency in states that are close by, as opposed to, a, you know, like reconstruction-based methods like autoencoders, which will say actually most of the image is different. And so they'll, they'll encode to completely different areas, state space, um, you know, with uh, um, a, a coloration that like a, a value, uh, sorry, um, values of those states that are not consistent locally with each other. So basically the claim is this representation is a lot easier to learn control. You're basically learning a lossy encoder and you want a lossy encoder, not a lossless encoder because most of the information is junk and you want to lose it. Uh, and so we, yeah, we also tried this in kind of uh, Carla color simulator to driving simulator if none of you have uh, uh, um, seen this before. Um, so uh, with a, with a kind of uh, reward that we came up with, which is generally highway progression. So like speed, uh, the product with the kind of highway unit normal vector, um, collision penalty, the steering penalty from not jerking the steering wheel too much. Um, <clears throat> the latent space could often look something like this. So we've got a similar thing, but for the driving scenario here, so we've got a camera attached to the front of our vehicle looking out to other vehicles here. And what we can see is by, you know, by just taking some of the images that encoded to these states here, we can look at what they're doing. And an example here is it's basically saying these states, these visual states are actually behaviorally similar. Um, and so what we've found here is that like here, you know, you're driving along and, you know, there's something to the right that is, you know, uh, the car may collide with if it turns, uh, turns, uh, to the right, but nothing to the left. And so really it doesn't matter if there's a, a potential collision to the right, if that's a brick wall, or like a gray car or like a red truck. And it doesn't really matter what the weather is either. Basically these states are the same thing. You would want to generally make the same action in these states. Um, some other examples is just open highway driving. Um, again, it doesn't really matter where shadows are if it doesn't affect how the planner Acts. They're all the same thing. And they encode to the same thing. Uh, or this one where the car's like flipped over onto the side. Um, again, it doesn't really matter what weather is or you know the coloration. Uh, they've all got kind of very low value because the car now can't do anything. Um, and um, and this is what the kind of latent space looks like. So this is like an 8D. Uh, so we've just got four two by twos um, showing the kind of latent space here. So in this case, uh, weather does not affect the robot's performance. So, uh, so we, you know, we didn't, um, I don't think Carla actually changes the physics of anything if the, the road's wet or not. But anyway, we basically compared sunny with cloudy and sunset, played everything exactly the same, but different weather. Um, and then and we can see in latent space that it's effectively worked out that all of these states, if the only variation is the weather, then they're the same state. Um, so I think, yeah, I think generally this is kind of useful for, you know, data efficiency um, and also for learning a um, robustness to like spurious kind of sources, you know, like uh, novelties in the environment that maybe don't matter if there's a particular tower shape that we haven't seen before. And then, they, you know, instead of like having that freak out the encoder, it's like, well, if you've already learned to desensitize to things that generally don't matter in the visual space, then, then, um, um, uh, then we may be more robust when we come to deploy 
in new situations when surprises may happen, especially when those surprises don't matter. Let me just check time. Okay, cool. So uh, also, yeah, I don't know what the format is. If you, if you want to ask questions during the talk, please go ahead. Otherwise, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll be around afterwards as well. Yeah, okay, cool. So yeah, moving more into the, the prediction objectives, like how can we how can we kind of forecast and train predictive models that can do tra trajectory forecasting that, that keeps in mind um, the fact that it will be used for downstream control. Um, the first work here is um, what we call control aware prediction objectives. Um, so, okay, so basically just as an example, like consider you're an autonomous vehicle and this is a scene that you're looking at. Um, maybe you are approaching the, 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 the intersection um, from, from this direction. We probably want to basically, we probably want to keep track of like all of these dynamic um, people in the scene and, and, and figure out where they may be going to, you know, to see if we should, you know, preemptively break before they get into our path. So um, there's a few pedestrians that are close here, but let me just focus on say this pedestrian. Um, so like, I want to kind of, so this paper is really about asking us the following question, which is like, you know, if this pedestrian here, if we predict that you know, the pedestrian walks this way, but in fact, they walk that way, does that prediction error matter? As opposed to something like this pedestrian over here, if we predict that they come to a stop, when in fact, they run across the road to make the light, does this prediction error matter? And so these two errors may have something like the same L2 um, cost, or even the same uh, log likelihood if we have a probabilistic model. But I think, I think everyone would kind of you know, agree if, that, if we're that this car, you know, because neither of these things would affect what we're going to do, but the difference between these two actions really would um, uh, make a difference. Um, for example, if we predict that they come to a stop when in fact they run, that could cause a collision. So the real world cost of this error is, is a lot higher um, than the other pedestrian. Uh, and so, yeah, and so how can we capture that when we're training trajectory forecasting models to focus on the things that matter and kind of ignore all of these other pedestrians that probably don't matter. Um, so yeah, okay. So basically, in the literature, um, a lot of uh, a lot of papers uh, basically have this this problem where they're you know the way in which they are trained, they are not aware of um, how they are going to be used downstream. So everything matters equally as far as uh, they're concerned. And so the solution that we're trying to come up with is can we at least weigh that, you know, whatever objective that you're using to train your trajectory forecaster, we at least weigh that according to some kind of effect uh, on downstream control, which I'll define in a second. And so the benefit is that we're, we really want to improve forecasting accuracy where it matters most. So, you know, so an example like, you know, the pedestrian that's crossing here, we, we care about predicting them accurately a lot more than say this pedestrian, where it's probably physically impossible for them to get in front of our car if we're already going to speed. Okay, so uh, yeah, so a lot of common metrics used in the literature and also a lot of um, trajectory for forecasting competitions held by like Waymo and Argo and Lyft and stuff like that. A lot of them will use uh, basically variants of uh, an L2 error. So like different types of displacement errors um, or something like the miss rate or the negative log likelihood. Um, none, of, none of which consider the down, downstream control. Some works do. Um, so there, there is a few works that will make different, um, and different works will make different assumptions. So, so things like end-to-end um, -end methods uh, will use, will often make the assumption that like, is their planner differentiable? Can they differentiate through it to do, or, you know, or basically do some kind of sensitivity analysis on the gradient at a particular point that it's making a prediction. Uh, other methods will kind of make the assumption is the plan as stochastic. So this is useful for any kind of policy gradient reinforcement learning methods. Um, uh, the other one is, you know, is the plan up, um, uh, a known function that you can use for counterfactual actions. You can say, what if I predicted this? Would the planner have done something different um, compared to the ground truth um, trajectory and the ground truth recorded um, actions? So for example, you know, a human driver, it's not a known function. We don't know, we can't just simulate what they would do otherwise. And so in this work, we basically did not make the follow up these two assumptions, but we did make the last one. So, and, and so the reason we were kind of interested in this regime was that often 
uh, planners and like real planners that go on to autonomous vehicles are not differentiable. They're very complex. There's a lot of logic for reasons of verification, debuggability, and explainability, um, as opposed to just throwing a neural net at it and saying like, you know, that's that's our planner. Um, uh, often the planners are not stochastic either. So you know, there's um, there's a particular logic that you know it follows. Uh, this is helpful for debugging as well <clears throat> when when things go wrong. Um, and the regime that we were actually at at Toyota was there was a planner that was like the safety critical bit. And that was something that coming along as a machine learner, being like, oh, what did, did Nets and this and this and this? Um, the, um, there was a lot of hesitancy, hesitancy to basically mess with the planner that people knew to be safe to a particular kind of level. Um, so, uh, so this was basically our way of saying, well, what if we can't touch the planner at all, but we can touch the prediction uh, method, which is probably using some kind of machine learning or, or something anyway, some kind of statistical model um, to basically work out where these pedestrians are going. Um, that's generally harder to hand code unless you're doing like constant velocity or other kind of um, um, simple, simple models. And so, uh, so we went with the last assumption and said, okay, um, often it is uh, often it is designed um, by by humans um, uh, when it's when it's a really safety critical um, uh, piece of software uh, and so yeah so we made the last one and and basically I'll just check time um, and so basically the thing that we would compare against uh, in our set of experiments was uh, uh, using um, was basically training up a likelihood based model. Um, so we used an order regressive uh, model called uh, R2P2, uh, reparameterized push forward policy. It's a normalizing flow way of coming up with um, a density on trajectories on where pedestrians or other vehicles may move, uh, given their past and also given a representation of the scene, maybe kind of LIDAR features or something like that. Um, and then all we'd do is we'd just take that objective and we'd just reweigh it um, when, we, when it comes time to training this predictive model. So an example was saying, okay, the weight that we want to place out on front um, of this might be something like uh, the distance between what the planner would do if we had the ground truth prediction of where everyone went versus the, what, uh, what the current model is uh, predicting during training. So we're comparing the ground truth with our prediction. If there is a big difference in what the planner would do then that was probably a critical thing to predict accurately. If there's no difference, like the pedestrian behind us and they walk left and but in fact they walk, like we predict they walk left and in fact they walk right, the, you know, this may say actually there's no difference, just keep, keep going, you're not going to collide with them either way. So, okay, so this was our way of basically kind of isolating those type of things. Uh, there was a, a slight variant here where we'd, you know, if it was a probabilistic model, you can often take you know, multiple samples, maybe you'll get different modes, maybe a car in an intersection on the left or right or straightforward, all the valid predictions. Uh, so if we have a kind of multimodal probabilistic model, uh, we had a worst case uh, version of that where we would take case samples and then just takes the maximum distance over that. Um, and then also uh, an attention-based uh, weighting, which I'll talk about in this next slide. So the attention-based weighting was um, uh, kind of using uh, Jean Macat's uh, um, uh, attention-based uh, multi-agent forecasting uh, method. So Jean is in our team, and he basically had some work that looks like this. So if you've got multiple um, vehicles uh, and they're all kind of interacting with each other, if you use if you use a transformer or like a self-attention to basically work out what um, and uh, basically what is the relationship between different vehicles, how much is, of what they choose to do is a function of the current position and velocity of everyone else. Um, the, the, the weight in which they are a function of each other, uh, other else is kind of, you know, in a sense, crudely kind of related to the uh, attention uh, matrix. So a set of uh, pairwise scalar weights um, represented by the thickness of the lines when kind of drawn out like this. So that car is very, um, our green car was very sensitive to that um, before it was about to turn, um, doing an unprotected left turn here. Uh, and so, yeah, so these were the methods uh, we used, uh, Carla, like I was just uh, talking about, and, um, and then using that attention-based um, method, this is kind of what it looks like when we're kind of training the model. So 
it's basically paying a lot of attention. You can see by the thickness of these attention weights to the different pedestrians around. And notice it's not paying attention to any pedestrian behind. So the errors by here don't factor into the training, but the errors on pedestrians that uh, might cross the road um, factor in a lot. So the simulation was basically pedestrians walk down the sides here, they occasionally cross the road. And then the car, the, the planner is to basically um, uh, stopped using uh, an intelligent driver model. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, and so the results uh, look something like this, where we've got um, uh, things like uh, collisions, uh, able to kind of drop collisions. Uh, so out of like 100, um, 100 progressions down that road that we just saw, uh, training just the base R2P2 um, algorithm, 11 collisions, training the exact same algorithm, but simply reweighing it. Um, we're able to kind of drop that down by a factor of 10 uh, when we use that worst case loss. So taking K samples from the probabilistic model and taking the worst case distance. And so interestingly, things like the displacement error that are kind of traditionally uh, used in competitions, we actually do worse on that uh, compared to just the, the basic likelihood model. The, our argument was that that doesn't actually matter. The, the, the thing that really matters is are you hitting pedestrians or not? Um, so that's the thing that we want to drive down. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah. So any questions uh, now? Uh, any burning questions? Uh, please go for it. Uh, otherwise, I'll jump into the, the third, and, third and final work. Uh, yeah. Okay. So the third and final work uh, here is um, uh, is the most recent, and um, uh, it's not online yet, but we we're hoping to put it put it online in two or three weeks. Uh, and it was called a risk aware prediction. Uh, for robust planning. Okay, so consider a kind of similar scenario where you've got other agents kind of around you and there's the potential to do, uh, for, for them to do things that are, you know, kind of safety critical in terms of how the car is planning, uh, trajectories that they may, may or may not choose. So consider we've got this bicycle around here and we're pretty sure based on their past trajectory that they are actually meaning to complete that turn and then follow alongside us. We always want to be like mindful of some of the rare events. Um, say, you know, maybe they change their minds and they, they cut in front of us here. And maybe a statistical model will say, well, actually, you know, based on what we've seen them do, based on the road layout, um, we're 95% sure that they'll do this, this thing over here, but we're kind of 5% sure that they'll do this thing up here. Wh whatever that probability is, even if it's a low probability, we'd still like our planner to be able to be aware of it, even if it doesn't necessarily mean it will slam on the brakes. We still like it to be aware of it so that it can balance risk with you know, the car behind it, the car's to the side of it and stuff like that. So it can work out um, the safest course of action. Um, and, and, you know, with things like this, often, you know, often low probability tail events, even if they are rare, they're often disproportionate um, in terms of um, uh, safety infractions and things, and things like this. So just because something is low probability doesn't mean it's low importance. Um, Okay, it's kind of obvious, but yeah, um, that so that's that's the scenario. Um, so can we can we forecast important events, not just the most likely? Um, okay, so in in risk aware planning, um, often often looks something like this, where we've got you know the state history of what you know agents and scene have done before us. Uh, we've got some kind of probabilistic model on their future motion on, on what we think they might do, and that might be a multimodal um, uh, model. And then the plan, it can often be kind of broke, broken down into these chunks where we've got some kind of evaluation of, you know, candidate trajectories that we might want to take or candidate uh, policy functions that we may want to um, execute. Uh, and then we'd like to be able to score that to work out, you know, which course of action is going to be, uh, is going to be best. And so risk aware planners are often a, um, a, a function of the entire uh, cost distribution as to, um, um, uh, that is kind of ascribed to different trajectories that a pedestrian may take. I think, oh um, yeah, maybe it'll, I'll be able to describe it in um, uh, this next segment a little bit clearer. So, okay, so we've got this, we've got this cyclist, um, most probably going to turn right. They may come into our path, um, so we want to be conscious of this. And that cost distribution—if you know—we take all of these paths, 
this particular course of action, you know, what is the distribution on cost? And the cost might look something like this. So we're most probable nothing is going to happen where most of our probability mass here is, but there's a little bit of probability um, that there is a high cost scenario here. And so often um, uh, the risk, I'll talk about some examples in a second, but the, the risk is really a functional that is a function of this function, the density function here, uh, that, uh, uh, that is often biased towards some of the kind of more uh, worst case scenarios, not necessarily the most, but often, you know, often it's designed to be a little bit conservative as opposed to the expectation of the cost, which would be uh, what we call risk neutral. Um, okay, so, so this work was, um, uh, so this work was really about saying, okay, what if, um, okay, so that would be fine uh, if, if we're just doing the planet, but can we actually kind of go back to this element here and work out what should we be predicting um, when, when, you know, given that we're going to be using the planet in this risk, um, uh, uh, in this kind of risk sensitive fashion. And so uh, one thought that we had here is that, say you've got these like high costs um, here, and say that's a really rare event. So, you know, we're talking, so something that's like maybe happening less than 1% of the time, you know, pedestrians standing on the edge of the road, they see us, they're probably not gonna step out, but we still wanna be sensitive to very low probabilities that someone may dart out behind a truck or something like that. If we're constrained um, during deployment that the planner has to operate in, in real time, which it does, um, then, you know, we may have to take many, many, many samples to be sensitive to these really rare events. So if something's gonna happen once in a thousand times, we'd probably need to take more than a thousand samples to have a high degree of confidence that the planner would be aware of those events. So we may not have enough compute at uh, deployment time to be able to do that quickly within you know, whatever millisecond budget that we have. So if that's the case, what we can do is go back to how we were training the probabilistic model offline. So, you know, maybe we have, um, you know, a lot of compute. Uh, we're happy for it to run for days. There's no real-time constraints. Can we come up with a better distribution that is going to be a little bit more biased towards uh, these kinds of um, costs, such that when we do our risk um, analysis with a fewer amount of samples, um, at deployment online, um, we're going to, with higher probability, be aware of things that are rare but safety critical that we want to be aware of at deployment time. Okay, and so what, and, and so kind of what I mean by that is instead of having some complicated function of the entire distribution of this that, you know, was shifted from just the expectation where you just take a bunch of samples and then compute the, it's, but if we want something that's kind of, um, you know, sensitive to the 99th percentile or something like that. An easier way to do this at, 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 at deployment time is if we could come up with a different distribution, a bias distribution, that if we were to compute the expected cost under the, the um, bias distribution, that would be equal to this, this risk level here. So implicitly taking into account uh, the very rare events. So, okay. So basically training this, we can take many, many samples during offline training to basically get this bias distribution um, such that when we draw from it with high likelihood, we're gonna be drawing some of these elements here. Um, and, so, and so basically this is how we kind of alter um, the training of our predictive model here. So we may have some true distribution about how people actually move um, and then we've got our biased distribution where, um, where we, tr we train it such that uh, this constraint holds um, the expectation of the, um, uh, uh, of the um, sorry, the, expect the expectation of the cost drawing samples under this biased distribution is equal to the risk if we had drawn those um, samples from the true distribution. And, and this is actually a, a, an under constraint. There's many, there's many cues that actually satisfy this thing here. So um, we also add in a regularizer to say, can you at least make it uh, as close as possible? You know, if, if you're selecting from all these things, can you at least make it as close as possible to the true distribution? So it at least looks correct. 
Uh, so you could just have a delta distribution that satisfies this, and that's not that's not so useful when it comes to interpretability. Um, and so the way that we um, okay, I'll wrap up in a few minutes. The way in which we train this uh, is just in a in a soft fashion, where we basically just look at uh, the error, um, the distance between these two things. So we're trying to satisfy these things as close as possible, even though they won't be exactly the same. Uh, and then we just have some hyperparameter balancing term um, with uh, this component here. And I'll show you. I'll show you what that looks like. So, oh, actually, yeah, sorry, just uh, um, one more slide to show you an example of what uh, example risk functions might look like. So it's often something that is uh, between the expected cost, a risk neutral assessment, uh, and the worst case cost, uh, given that cost is, a, a, is a, um, a random variable, so it has a distribution here. So often examples of things like the entropic risk, which is kind of like a soft maximum with the, the log sum x here. Um, but then there's also things like the conditional value at risk. This is um, related to um, expected improvement in the equation optimization literature. It's, uh, it's a bit hard to pass here, but basically what it looks like is this. If you've got a distribution over the cost, um, you might have a mean here. Um, uh, you know, there's um, there's some hyperparameter that the user sets um, sigma, and this 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 and and the meaning of this is to say I want you to be sensitive to say the 99th percentile of the worst case or sorry yeah 99th percentile of highest costs that could happen. So kind of you know some of the worst things that could happen. So with 0.99 we select on the you know with the, using CDF basically from that point onwards that mass here like what is the ex what is the expected value past that point so, so then we've got the c bar that's um, here that's very sensitive to things that happen one percent of the time uh, so that's that's kind of what that means um and then um just to kind of uh run a didactic experiment first we had this example here where uh a vehicle is driving along and then we'll put a pedestrian sorry it's a little bit blocked by this but We've got a pedestrian standing here, and there's a bimodal distribution as to where they will walk. So they'll either walk uh, slowly to the red zone or quickly out of the foul way to the green zone. So if they walk slowly to the red zone uh, um, and we're going fast, we, we may hit them. So that's that's the kind of idea um, with the situation. So we and so basically our method was to train up a probabilistic model of how they might work, uh, walk. Um, so we used a conditional variational autoencoder. And our way of biasing was to use the exact same model, but just bias and latent space um, according to the risk level. So do we want the 99th percentile or the 95th percentile or the 99.9th percentile? Um, what is it that we're interested in being sensitive to? So that's a kind of human input uh, that basically biases where we're going to sample in latent space. Uh, and so this can be trained, it uh, doesn't matter how long we can, you know, have it on days on AWS. Um, there, there's no real time constraints here when training this um, CVE that can be learned, learned to be um, uh, biased. Um, and so this will bias the distribution of what will happen when the, the plan is kind of like asking for samples and, 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 and wants some biased samples towards um, computing the risk that uh, that the user wants it to be sensitive to. So, so an example here is like walking across the road. This is the ground truth distribution. Um, say, you know, half the time it's going to be dangerous. Half the time they'll make it across safely um, to the other side. Uh, and then uh, if we then train up our CVE, it's like, it's okay, it's not great, but it's kind of learned that there's two modes here, um, even though this never happens um, in reality. So training up a CVE in the normal way um, we got it to look like this. Um, and so then that would be called uh, risk neutral prediction. Um, if we were to sample from this distribution and say, can you just, uh, you know, what is the expected cost of our current trajectory if, if, it's, if this is how we predict they will walk and, and, and we don't deviate. Um, but then the risk biased um, prediction looks something like this. So now if the plan is saying, you know, what is the kind of, the, the cost or the risk associated with you know um, progressing down this way if I if I want to be biased towards things that are you know kind of bad um, the distribution now looks like this so 
So you, I think this is kind of nice because it's a little bit interpretable. It kind of looks like what it looked before, but kind of much more, much more biased towards the bad things that can happen in the scene. So yeah, so the advantage, the advantage here is that the planner doesn't need to take a million samples at deployment time. It only needs to take a few to be sensitive to those events um, if uh, time is off the essence of deployment. Um, and so, and so basically, if we were to look at that risk estimation error um, uh, in, in, a, in a scenario like that, the, the kind of average, the average error of um, uh, taking, uh, of, of computing the risk using the biased model uh, is basically um, in this zone here, um, the, average, the average risk error is, is, is basically nothing. Whereas the, the regular way of doing things, you generally need more, more and more samples um, before your estimation of risk is going to be um, accurate. So, um, you know, in this case, it's only 20, but like in more complicated scenarios, uh, it, may be, it may require more and more kind of um, um, uh, samples. So, so, yeah, basically um, here we've got um, two different um, risk levels. And the problem is the closer that sigma gets to one, so the more kind of nines you start caring about, like I want to be sensitive to the 99.9th percentile of things that could happen. Um, generally, the longer it takes for that um, blue curve to reach um, zero risk um, error. So what, what, that, what that really means is like, if you know, if you want to, um, you know, if you want to get to kind of 99.99th percentile, you're generally going to have to take 10,000 samples to get a good estimate of what can happen one out of 10,000 times. Um, yeah, so uh, uh, we also kind of looked at the um, Waymo open motion data set beyond just our didactic scenario. And um, uh, unfortunately, I don't have a better picture yet because we're still working on it, we haven't published it yet. But um, basically, uh, the uh, you know, just training a CBAE, uh, it's not very good yet, but like basically kind of looking at, you know, where this um, vehicle may go, if we're this vehicle heading in this direction, we might get a few different predictions um, from a, a risk unbiased model, but then the more we start buying us, biasing it, the more trajectories we start sample that are coinciding with the path that, that our ego vehicle wants to go in. Um, so risk level 0.5, risk level 0.95, they're basically all of them are getting sampled such that um, it looks like it might collide with us. So, um, yeah, so that, that's, that's what it looks like before. Um, similar, similar kind of effect um, with the risk and estimation error using both, both models. Um, yeah, and that's, uh, yeah, that's it. So, thanks, Ron. Yeah. Any questions for Ron? Um, I don't know if this is a question, but um, if you go back kind of earlier in the slides where you're showing the latent space, um, yeah. the, you had the, I think it was the images from Carlo and then the, or yeah, or this one, or yeah. Uh, yeah. So okay. I guess in both, yeah, this is, yeah, this is what I was thinking of. In, in this case, and also the case with the Majoko simulation of the, the quadruped and so on, it seems to me that in both of these cases, that what you're generating is a is a mapping from kind of an image to a latent space. Yes, that right? So that what you talk about is kind of the state is a single image, right? Yes. Yeah. I mean, kind of traditionally in kind of perception systems, the, the state estimate, um, however you want to call it, would not necessarily be a function of a single image, but of like an entire history of yeah. observed sensor data, right? Yeah. And I guess the, the the kind of standard ways we think about what that latent space in a state estimate should, should encode, they're kind of two classical ones. One is a like a point estimate of what the true state of the world is yeah. or the relevant states of the world. And the other one is some kind of belief state of what the, you know, some yeah. kind of like it's a particle physics or some kind of yeah. um, in distribution of the possible states of the world. I guess the question I'm, I'm asking is when you're going from a single image like this to a single state, there's not really, as far as I can see, a question about um, things like occlusion or unsensed objects, which you might have different 
um, beliefs about you might have seen in the past and you're yep. not sure where they are now, like you saw something drive behind a, a truck, but it might emerge and cut in front of you or something yep. like that. So I guess I'm wondering, like so I'm not sure it's really a well-formed question. No, I'm no, wondering I, if you've thought about like observational history, occlusion, beliefs, and how that relates to this kind of idea of a latent space that you're looking Yeah. At. Yeah. No, it, yeah, it's it's a great question. Um, I think uh, so Amy, the first author, did do an extension of this work into the partially um, observable domain, but I don't actually know too much about the work. But um, the, yeah, so this work didn't address that. Um, uh, some of her later work did, but yeah. So so we we effectively assumed that uh, the world is fully observable, um, and I think what we did is we'd take the last three or four frames and then we would effectively encode them all together so that we had some concept of speed. Um, uh, and then and then and then in in Carla we basically uh, this is just a kind of clipped, this is kind of just a clipped observation for, for the sake of slides, but it was, um, we just kind of put five cameras around and so it had a 300 degree view of everything. So yeah, so occlusions did exist, but um, the hope here was that they didn't exist frequently. Um, so, so yes, yeah, in reality that will be um, violated. Um, we didn't address that here. Uh, we just said, you know, if there's going to be any, um, uh, uh, you know, relevant effects from the set of observations that you have um, without forming a belief, you know, can, can we kind of work with that? And so I think, uh, you know, in a sense, like if, you, if, you, if we, you know, if we, if we had some kind of uh, uh, recursive RNN kind of thing that was able to take into account all of the observational history, this would be kind of like a non-explicit way of trying to encode the the history of observations. And I think what you're talking about is more an explicit way of representing beliefs that would probably be a lot more data efficient if we were to do a similar thing like what you said here, whereas our method naively would take a lot more data to implicitly learn the same thing. That if if it's seen a you know cargo behind another car 20 images ago, that you know, does that have an effect on future images? And it would need to see enough of those variations to implicitly figure it out. So uh, yeah, a lot longer to train would require a lot more data to train. Um, could theoretically do it, but um, but yeah, yeah, this would be a better way. But, but maybe another, actually, maybe within your framework, it would be compatible because just looking at the images on the right, I don't know if this is really captured, but it looks like there there might be some scenes where you could see there's a club <coughs> car in front of you, and others where if you look at kind of the top image on the right hand side, there yeah. might be glare from the sun. Yeah. So there might be kind of the same state, but one version of it has a much higher certainty than the other. So yeah. it, so one is like, they're both kind of a, a distribution centered on the same point, but one much more diffuse than the other. Yeah. Would they, do you think they would correspond to the same latent state um, or different latent states? Um, so in this case, if it, if it saw enough of them, it would, I think it would eventually work out that these latent states should be separated if you've got this glare and you've seen enough cases of this type of glare that half of the time, a few seconds later, oh, there appears to be a car where right. I saw glare before. And the other half of the time, um, there was not a, car, not a car. So the expected difference in, the expected difference, expectation of a glare um, between those uh, two events is sometimes there is a reward um, difference between a glare and no glare where you are much more certain. So I think, it would learn to separate the things. It would just be a more data inefficient way yeah. of doing it if we only had the system that we have now. Yeah. 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 Any other questions uh, on Don? Sorry. Sorry. Thanks. Um, well, while we're on the slide, here you've learned to take what your camera gave you and build a latent representation that's an efficient encoding of that. Is there a way to learn to make a camera using your method that would just not have measured the useless parts? Yeah, I don't know. Because like it's I think what what is what is useful and what is not useful, it's not you can't just say this pixel is never useful. It depends on the rest of the scene. So um, do you mean like a like happening before this in the hardware or yeah, could we make the the image formation process part of the Basically, you're embedding uh, okay. visual information. 
because we make the image formation process part of that embedding process and then learn the image formation to be more efficient. Hmm. Do you mean kind of kind of like our eyes where we're a bit more we have a bit more resolution and more like center. evolution where evolution mm -hmm. decides what eyes make sense for a given task oh yeah maybe yeah um yeah yeah maybe i did yeah maybe using yeah uh so the metric here is the bike simulation it, yeah the, so is the yeah is the bike simulation so the behavioral difference between the two different um types so Hmm. Yeah, the I think hmm, the it would be I think it it wouldn't necessarily know if it's not collecting enough information. So if you've got uh, if it's so poor, like if it's if it hasn't got enough resolution that things appear random, not because they are random, but because you're just not collecting enough informa information. Um, um related to what we were just talking about i think um so maybe starting from an over complete <clears throat> camera it might be able to quickly yeah. it down but not the components yeah maybe um interesting yeah i don't i don't think it would have a way of saying it doesn't have it needs more information uh yeah it, you could probably yeah, okay maybe it could help you inform how to make your sensor worse but not how to make it better i think yeah interesting but yeah, kind of like a lossy design of your camera that can't can't undo, can't work out what else it needs. Thanks to improve. Yeah. So quick jump back. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, um, I just got a very about the picture frame. Mm -hmm. Now, could you demonstrate why And I'm wondering. Uh, how how the like these kind of right? like in the training training attention stands ground for attention um, yeah that's right there's no ground truth for attention weights um it's just our representation of how reality um our crude kind of model of how reality works but not yeah, not reality itself. So there is no ground truth we can compare to. The ground truth that we can compare to is where they actually go in the future. So basically the inputs to this model is where has everyone in this multi-agent scene uh, gone in the past and where are they now? Uh, and then the ground truth is where do they go in the future um, based on our recordings? And then the interim in our model is basically trying to work out uh, that mapping from multi-agent trajectory to multi-agent future trajectory. Um, uh, via this uh, at, uh, um, attention mechanism. And so really this is just our way of, if we come up with this architecture for our probabilistic model, um, can we then basically hack at it to say, so this is just trained independently of uh, the next predictive tasks. Can we train this first and then just look at what would our ego vehicle um be sensitive to so there's a full matrix here but we actually only care about one of the rows which is the pairwise we don't really care about the pairwise interactions between uh, another agent and and a third agent really really care about our agent that we're trying to control and then all of the other um uh, vehicles there um and so uh yeah uh basically that was just that was just our way of saying what what are the agents that are kind of relevant. But it turns out that like I uh, actually it didn't um, this attention waiting it didn't actually do any kind of better than the the regular thing. So uh, for whatever reason this method turned out to not work so well. So uh, we never dug into it, but um, yeah, yeah. And another question is about this part. Uh, let's say you have a uh, and then you you uh, will create some of the shapes of the basic phase. And in the testing phase, you need this kind of thing or something to use like the basic Or something, yeah. Okay. Uh, that is the uh, let me Let me just jump over to the end. Could you explain like, how, how did you like well, Which part did you do? Which part? Do we remove. Yeah, because like in the recent part, you said that you will put some constraints about this. Yes. Phase, right? yeah. And in the testing phase, you 
Uh, yeah, no. So the so so all of this, yeah. So training, so training. Um, we would train with uh, this loss here, where um, uh, we've got we're trying to come up with some um, biased model, uh, and then against some uh, other model that's just trying to model how people um, are actually moving. And so uh, we train using this, and then at deployment, it's very simple. All we do is we grab this model, we take a few samples, not thousands, but like a few, as much as we can afford to at online deployment. And then all we have to do is take the expectation of the cost of that low number of samples. And that evaluates a particular, say action trajectory or a particular policy. Um, and then we can use that as a way of doing policy evaluation of comparing that with another thing when it comes time to deciding, you know, should we take action A, or action B. Um, so yeah, test time is actually very simple. Uh, it's it's just that. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. During during deployment, it during deployment at test time, it doesn't see any of this. Yeah, um, if if that makes if that makes sense. Um, it's just training data that's that that gets fed into this. So how many samples? Yeah, so I think for um, so for when we were trying to be sensitive to things like 99, 99th percentile, we would we would often train with um, uh, four, uh, 40, 92, so two to the 12, two to the 12 samples. Um, and then with testing, we would often take like um, two to the seven, so like 128 samples or something like that. And then that was enough to be comparable to taking 4,000. Um, yeah, so th that, that, was kind of, that was kind of what we were using for the Waymo um, open data set as an example of something real and not our basic didactic, you know, bimodal pedestrian example. Yeah. yeah. Any other questions for Ron? Um, Yeah, okay, so simulators first, not simulators, and then diff and then kind of heterogeneous kind of so data with different agents. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 so, um, yeah, yeah. Okay, so good question. So I think in the so in the first work with the by simulation, um, there was no notion of agent category. But in the second two with prediction, there, there was implicitly. I just didn't talk about it. But yes, you're right. So uh, yeah, we talked about um, pedestrians and vehicles. But like in both cases, we were just assuming all agents are homogeneous. Um, so yeah, in reality, they're not. Um, and then I, I guess like um, probably all I could say is to naively take this and apply it to you know real world data where different agents different, um, uh, we would be reliant on some kind of de a detector um, that says, you know, this is this type of agent, or, you know, this is a representation of this type of agent, if there's not just a finite number of classes, um, uh, such that we can model the fact that pedestrians don't act like cyclists, and they don't act like motorcycles, and, and, and things like this. Um, uh, yeah, so uh, yeah, so we, we assumed homogeneity in terms of the other agents. Um, the I think, and then you also asked about simulators, and I think yeah, so I think I would say this like we so yeah, we only we only we only use simulators in this really just to kind of uh, um, score ourselves on interactive um, control. So you know, we we are reliant on simulators to evaluate what we're doing. Um, um, as opposed to offline um, uh, data sets, or at least in terms of the um, control aware prediction objectives, um, to not fool ourselves into thinking that we're doing well on offline data sets when um, when when we put it into an interactive set setting, it actually you know doesn't doesn't do that well. Kind of kind of problems like associated with the you know dagger paper and, and stuff. So 
Um, uh, uh, but, 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 but that's kind of it. It's, it's really just to evaluate the pipeline. It's not so much like sim to real or anything like that where we're assuming that the simulator is accurate. It's really just to test like we, that we're not fooling ourselves and then hoping that, you know, basically if we were to deploy this in the real world with some modifications for things like you're saying, like in the real world, agents are heterogeneous and, and stuff like that. Uh, hopefully, fingers crossed, it would, the, you know, we would expect to see similar types of things in realistic scenarios as well. Um, but yeah, no, no implicit assumption that it has to be trained with a simulator. It was just, it was just easier and we're not going to kill anyone, but, um, and then, yeah, let's, let's red tape. So, yeah. Yeah. Any other questions for Ron? Yeah. One more. Um, in the, the slide we showed, it was kind of a car moving horizontally and it was paying attention to the positions kind of in front of it. Yeah. Yeah. I was going back to it. Yeah, this one. I'm probably misunderstanding something here, but it seems to me there's something, this, this was about kind of understanding which agents it's important to predict. predict That's right. Emotion. That's right. Yeah. So there's something kind of a little bit um, chicken and egg or paradoxical or something like that, because which agents are important, but depends on what they could do, mm -hmm. which is a prediction. Mm -hmm. um, so you're saying, you know, you need mm -hmm. to have, in some sense, <laughs> some kind of crude prediction, mm -hmm. like implicitly. I know this is kind of done in a bit more of a black box way, but mm -hmm. implicitly there needs to be some kind of crude prediction of what this agent could do. That's right. To say it could have a negative impact. To say, I need to predict it more. Kind of. Yeah, yeah. Find the prediction. Yeah. Is that? Yeah, 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 uh, yeah, yeah. That's that's yeah. That's very insightful. So yeah, that's correct. Um, the answer is there was a chicken, then an egg, then another chicken, and that's yeah. it. Um, so basically, we would train, and so the the, the original chicken is um, uh, um, yeah. Okay, so the, the original chicken is just this. So we just train initially assuming everything is equally important, uh, and then we get this. So we train this predictive model. Um, and then we grab this out. And so then this is, this is the egg. Okay. Um, and then what we do is we go back and then we, we take that here and then retrain, retrain the second generation of chicken. Okay. Um, and then that's it. Yes. Um, maybe you could do that more times. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's, yeah. that's what we did. And, and, and I mean, this ended up doing fairly poorly. So maybe we should actually do more generations of chicken and egg, but yeah. Yeah, or it'd be interesting to understand kind of why. Yeah, or investigate yeah. it further, which we which we didn't um, end up doing. But yeah, um, so yeah, I, I mean, I thought it was interesting too. It seems like an interesting alternative idea to to weigh whatever objective um, we came up with before, whether it was like displacement error or or the likelihood. Um, uh, but yeah, we weren't. We weren't Couldn't it sure. also then be used in what you showed later if you're kind of generating a sample sample based prediction to say which agents to kind of sample predictions from more densely? Yeah, I think, I think that's, I think, yeah, I think they're very related and we didn't actually look at the intersection between the two, but yes, I think that the things that you're going to be more, um, that, you know, if you're looking at um, uh, demonstrations on how humans have been driving their car in multi-agent situations to work out what they're attending to, um, they're probably attending to things that they know might have a high or a potential high cost um, associated with what they're trying to do. So, uh, um, yeah, I think, I think, um, I think you probably could combine them in an interesting way to, to do better than either of them alone. Yeah. Um, yeah, maybe, maybe we'll do that as next week. So that's a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, thank our speaker, Ron, again for the presentation. Thank you. Thanks so much.